My name is Mark S. Weiner, and I am the executive director of the Telos Paul Picon Institute. TPPI is an independent, nonprofit, charitable organization based in Manhattan that grew from the journal Telos and that carries forward the work of its founder, Paul Picone, by sparking theoretically grounded conversations about contemporary society, culture, and politics. I encourage you to visit our website to learn more. That's at telosinstitute.net. This is the second in a series of webinars hosted by TPPI that reckon with the response within higher education to the atrocities perpetrated by Hamas on October 7th, 2023. The series will take place for one year on the 7th of uh, each month, starting at noon Eastern Standard Time. Each webinar will last between 90 minutes and two hours, though the uh, webinar last month continued informally for another hour after its nominal conclusion. And we invite all of you to remain afterwards this time as well for a more informal, unrecorded conversation and to join the panelists on screen if you wish. The webinar uh, series is part of a larger initiative about October 7th that will include an in-person conference tentatively scheduled for November 8th, 9th, and 10th in New York City. I hope to announce uh, further details in coming weeks, uh, and that will culminate with a special issue of the renowned social theory journal Telos. This special issue will bring together the most trenchant contributions that have grown from the conversations that we cultivate here online and in our conference. We hope that it will provide a distinctive memorial statement about how we got to this place and how we can find our way out. We hope that this series will model the complex multifaceted conversation of the classroom, as well as the trust and the intimacy of a small community, and that it will provide a forum in which we can dig deeply, think carefully, and avoid simplicities. In that light, if you'll allow me, I'm brought to mind of George Eliot's words about Dorothea in Middlemarch, that the effect of her being on those around her was incalculably diffusive. The growing good of the world, Eliot wrote, is partly dependent on unhistoric acts, small, quiet acts that go unnoticed. I think that the simple act of speaking together with depth, consideration, and nuance is one such act with an incalculably diffusive effect. Thanks to Gabby Brom for what he's done to make this happen. In addition to organizing this webinar series, he's also been creating podcasts that follow up at length with each panelist individually, and he's been soliciting blog posts for Telescope, and there's much more to come. Before I turn off my camera, I want to add one more thing, namely that TPPI is an independent organization. We believe that it's precisely our independence from established institutions that makes the work that we do possible. Because we're not connected with a university or with a professional association, we are entirely dependent on individual outside support. One special way that you can be a part of what we do is by becoming a sponsoring member of the Institute. You'll receive discounts on Telos Press Books. You'll have access to exclusive digital content that we hope to create this year, not only about October 7th, but also related to another long-term initiative parallel to this one that we'll be launching shortly about China. And best of all, you'll receive a subscription to the journal Telos. If you can't become a sponsoring member, know that we cherish all contributions, no matter what the size, and they make you an essential part of our work. All contributions are tax deductible in the United States. To learn more, visit telosinstitute.net forward slash memberships. So thanks for being here today. And now over to Gabby. Thank you, Mark, uh, very much for those uh, eloquent words and those uh, gracious sentiments. Without uh, further ado, that brings us to the panel. Speaking uh, first tonight, Jeffrey Herf is the Distinguished University Professor Emeritus at the University of Maryland, author of many important books on subjects intimately related to our uh, theme 
tonight, which is Historians on Ideology and Politics in the 1948 War, October 7, and the Aftershocks of World War II. Dr. Herf's title of his presentation tonight is as follows, Israel's Moment, the Forgotten International Politics Regarding the Establishment of the State of Israel. Jeffrey. Gabe uh, and Mark, uh, thank you. Thank you, uh, uh, David and uh, Russell. Um, uh, thank you, the and Telos organization. Uh, the, um, I'm going to talk about um, Israel's Moment, but also uh, uh, about the uh, contribution of Islamism uh, to the War of 1948. Uh, uh, Telos, uh, since it began in 1968, has uh, stood for a number of different things. Uh, it has been a controversial journal, a journal that uh, 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 has entertained a variety of points of view. Uh, but uh, I think one thing that is um, uh, that has continued is the idea that um, in the political history of the world, ideas matter. Uh, ideas are a causal factor. Uh, and uh, I think that the question that I want to begin uh, my remarks with is, why did this war happen? Why did October 7th happen? What kind of causal interpretation can we offer? Um, none of us are diplomats or political leaders, and I don't think any of us are quite stupid enough to think that we can offer solutions as to what, what should be done. Uh, but, uh, but what we can offer is um, our scholarship. So here we go. Um, Beginning in the 1930s, a distinctive in interpretation of the religion of Islam emerged known as Islamism. It emerged in the Muslim Brotherhood in Egypt and in the writings of the Brotherhood's most important Palestinian associate, Hajimena Hosseini. In his 1937 text, Islam and the Jews, which Matthias has done so much to um, uh, uh, explicate, that text uh, was translated and published in Germany in 1938. Uh, Husseini, in that text, transformed the dispute over land and territory uh, uh, between the Zionists and the Arabs that Benny has examined so well. Uh, he transformed that dispute in his own mind into a, a war of religion uh, between the world of Islam and the world of the Jews. Uh, the Jews, he said, in Islam and the Jews, which is a shocking text, um, it should be translated uh, into, into English. Parts of it are available in English. The Jews, he said, had deserved being enslaved in, in ancient Egypt. Uh, they had also deserved the persecutions that they had endured over the centuries. And the Zionist project was just the latest of a seventh century Jewish aggression against the religion of Islam. The Nazis paid close attention to Husseini's views. And as I indicated in 1938, they published a German translation of Islam and the Jews. And they were glad to learn that there was another tradition of Jew hatred that was not due to the Christian traditions. Um, uh, uh, instead, um, it emerged from a 20th century radical interpretation of the Quran and the biography of Muhammad uh, that tradition, which uh, we know as Islamism. Uh, the uh, Islamists uh, uh, revised the religion of Islam, and this is a subject of great debate. I'm not going to resolve it right here. We can perhaps discuss it later. The Islamists placed hatred of Judaism and the Jews at the core of their understanding of that very large religion, and they made the war against Zionism into a war of religion. These ideas were articulated by Husseini four years before he arrived in Nazi Berlin in November 1941, and they offered the foundation of what became a world-famous collaboration between the Islamists, the Arab exiles, and the Nazis from 1941 to 45. And uh, he and other exiles uh, from the Middle East uh, joined in the war against Britain, the United States, the Soviet Union, what was then called the United Nations against liberal modernity and against the shared enemy, the Jews. And historians documented the details of that collaboration. I did so in my 2009 work, Nazi Propaganda for the Arab World. Uh, parts of it are in a recently published essay collection called Three Faces of Antisemitism. 
Joseph Schechtman in 1965 and Lukasz Harasowicz in 1966 wrote pioneering histor histories of that collaboration. And in recent decades, as more archives became available, Klaus Gensicki uh, in Germany, Matthias Kunzel there, Bernard Lewis, Klaus Michael Maumann and Martin Cooper is also German historians, and David Motadl in London have offered far more detail about the scope and consequences of the Nazi Islamist Alliance. One reason that this webinar is valuable uh, and important is that these works do not appear often enough on the syllabi in uh, our colleges and universities uh, and uh, are not read often enough in the editorial offices and the offices of um, uh, uh, non-governmental organizations. Uh, uh, they're not read often enough. Um, the Hamas attack of October 7th it should be a shock that ends the neglect of this uh, scholarship. Um, the, um, the argument that Kunzel has made, I think most forcefully, and it's an implication of this scholarship, is that the Islamist hatred of Judaism, the Jews, and therefore of Zionism in Israel is the most important cause, uh, the most important cause uh, of the decision of the leaders of the Palestine Arabs in 1948 to reject the United Nations partition resolution, and ever since to wage war and reject compromise with the state of Israel. Uh, as Benny has uh, understood uh, and written, there are uh, obviously forces within Palestinian society that have sought some kind of compromise, but the, the, the veto, the crucial veto has always been with the Islamists. In social science terms, the Islamist ideology has been an independent, not a dependent causal factor. It is a cause, not a consequence of the wars that have taken place. And so it, since October 7th, when we've heard people speak about placing the events of October 7th in context, the famous word context is generally or often uh, used to refer to uh, a history of Israeli um, oppression, uh, exclusion, uh, expulsion, and that in one way or another, somehow the attack of October 7th uh, is a uh, response more or less uh, justified uh, to this uh, history of Israeli sin. Uh, the argument that, uh, 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 that I am making, uh, and as you'll hear that uh, Matthias Kunzel has made, uh, uh, and there are elements of it in Benny's work on jihad in 1948, um, is that the, we're speaking of, we also speak about context. We also want to place events in context. But the context that we have in mind is a different one. That is the continuity of this long tradition that began in the 1930s and exploded again on October 7th. Um, the, um, uh, there are a few uh, assumptions uh, about the 1948 uh, uh, in its international context that I would like to, that I mentioned in uh, the book, Israel's Moment. Uh, President Harry Truman was very important for the passage of the United Nations Partition Resolution, um, but the support for the establishment of the State of Israel coming from the Soviet Union and the Soviet bloc in 1947-48 was even more consequential. It extended, beyond, it not only include more support, but it also included making it uh, possible for Jews from Eastern Europe to get to Palestine, and it included delivery of weapons. In those very same years, the establishment of the State of Israel overlapped with the beginning of the Cold War. And in the United States State Department, uh, the Defense Department and the Central Intelligence Agency, uh, by 1947, a, co a consensus had emerged, uh, an anti-Zionist consensus had emerged. Uh, and the history of that uh, consensus is one that I examine in great detail in Israel's moment. Suffice it to say that uh, Secretary of State George Marshall and the Director of the Policy and Planning Staff, the by then famous George F. Kennan, uh, concluded that the establishment of a Jewish state in Palestine would undermine Western access to Arab oil necessary for the reconstruction of Western Europe, and that it would be a boon to the Soviet Union because there was an assumption in the British Foreign Office and in the American State Department that Zionism uh, did have some connection to communism 
and to Soviet interests, and the establishment of a Jewish state would uh, serve as a kind of Trojan horse for Stalin's expansion in the Middle East. Uh, the state of Israel was not, in other words, a product of American imperialism, uh, to use the, uh, the, uh, that language. Um, conversely, uh, the, the famous term anti-fascism or anti-Nazism in 1945 to 49 had a very pro-Zionist connotation. And that was true for French communists, French socialists, Gaullists, uh, uh, members of the Labour Party who were not in power in Britain, uh, uh, to emerging German liberals who were not yet uh, in a sovereign state, and in New York and in Washington, the United States, uh, to uh, very prominent American liberal and left-leaning politicians like Robert Wagner and Emanuel Seller, and left-leaning journals like The Nation uh, yeah. and PM, who all saw the Zionist project as an example of anti-colonialism, as a struggle against British colonialism, and who saw it also as um, a, a part of the, uh, a, a rather as in tune with the anti-Nazi passions that had emerged in the Second World War. The Nazi Islamist, people didn't use the word Islamist in 1947-48, but let the, 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 the famous collaboration between the Mufti and Hitler uh, was not something that was just known to a few historians. Uh, this was part of a uh, public debate uh, in the United States uh, and uh, uh, was um, uh, uh, the Zionist project in those years was a cause celebre of liberals and the left. There were moderate conservative uh, figures in the United States uh, who also uh, looked sympathetically. Uh, on this project, but the, the, the most passionate and important support came from liberals on the left. And one of the things that they wanted to do, they failed at, which was an indication of how little political power Jews in the United States had in 1946-47. And what they wanted to do, the American Zionist Emergency Council, Emanuel Seller in Congress, Robert Wagner in the Senate, um, what they wanted to do was to convince the United States, Britain, and the Soviet Union and France to um, indict Hajiman al Husseini for war crimes in Nuremberg for his collaboration with the Nazi regime. Subsequently, the uh, evidence that has come to fore indicates that there was a good case uh, for indicting him for the crimes of incitement to genocide. Um, uh, but uh, their efforts uh, to, um, they were unable uh, to convince the State Department um, uh, to do so. Uh, Hajiman al Husseini was arrested in May of 1945 uh, by the French army and was then in custody uh, in under house arrest outside of Paris until June of 1946. Uh, and during that time, uh, American liberals uh, and the British Foreign Office actually uh, were urging the French Foreign Ministry under Georges Bidot to deport him either to Britain or to send him uh, to be indicted on trial. And the French uh, and the French Foreign Ministry archives uh, demonstrate this clearly, came to the conclusion that being on the right side, the good side rather, to be on the good side of Hajiman al Husseini would be beneficial to French political interests in Syria, Lebanon, and North Africa after the war. Uh, so being on the good side of Hajiman al Husseini was not a matter of anti colonialism. It was something that the French foreign ministry concluded would be important for uh, its continued political influence uh, in the region. A note about um, uh, the beginnings of the Cold War and the failure to indict Husseini. German historians uh, have written many books about uh, the post-war years and the way in which the history of Nazism was either forgotten or uh, pushed to the side uh, as the uh, policy of containing the Soviet Union and communism uh, took center stage. The, the history of West Germany in those years uh, is a history of many chameleons and a history of many cynics, a history of people like Kurt Kiesinger, who was deeply involved in Nazi propaganda toward the Arab world and elsewhere, but who miraculously after the war rediscovered the virtues of liberal democracy and how terrible Nazism was. And Kiesinger was a representative figure of those 
former Nazi politicians and officials who uh, were able to um, uh, change their, uh, their tune very quickly and understood that changing one's tune and saying nice things about elections and the free press was a way of uh, restarting a political career. And he became the chancellor of West Germany in the 1960s. So cynicism uh, uh, and chameleons, uh, uh, and certainly perhaps, you know, uh, some element of genuine change of heart is at, wo is at work here. The striking feature about Hajimin al-Husseini's return to Egypt in 1946, uh, and then his assumption of leadership of the Palestine national movement uh, was that he didn't have to change his views at all. Uh, and uh, Matthias uh, uh, has used the German expression Zonderweg, that is the special path, to refer to one of the distinctive features of um, of Arab political culture in the years immediately after the war. When he returned to Egypt, it would have been possible for the Egyptian government to decide to send him to one of those one of those uh, 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 trials, uh, but they refused, and instead he received a hero's welcome, especially from ha Hassan Abana, the leader of the Muslim Brotherhood, who said that uh, Hitler and Himmler are dead, uh, but uh, Amin is here to continue uh, the struggle. Uh, well, uh, the Husseini went on to then make the absolutely disastrous decision in 1948 to 47 to begin a civil war uh, in efforts to undermine uh, the United Nations Partition Resolution, which had it been implemented in 1947 or 48, would have created a Palestinian state then, uh, and so many, so many, so much misery and suffering would have been eliminated. One more point, because I promise to be brief, and I have a point about racism. Uh, the PLO representatives in the United Nations uh, in the 1970s made the case, they made the claim that Zionism was a form of racism. Uh, and we people listening to this webinar know that an enormous controversy has surrounded that that claim then and since. But I want to make a point about it that perhaps it's not been made quite as often. And that is the successful Palestinian argument or the Palestinian argument that Zionism is a form of racism was in its origins a form of psychological and political projection psychological and political projection. And the text that I have in mind is that of Hajimin al-Husseini's cousin, Jamal Husseini, who was the representative of the Arab Higher Committee at the United Nations in 1947-48. And Jamal Husseini, and the text is in Israel's moment, gave a, an address first in London and then in New York explaining why the Arab Higher Committee rejected the UN Palace, uh, partition resolution and rejected the Jewish state in uh, British mandate uh, Palestine. And what he said there was, and these are his words, the Arab world is a racial homogeneity, a racial homogeneity, and that the introduction of an alien uh, entity, the Jewish state, would destroy that racial homogeneity. And he said, Europe, with its different languages and different cultures and uh, different peoples, is an example of the way in which multiplicity, he didn't use the terms multiplicity, I'm paraphrasing here, the way in which the absence of racial homogeneity contributes to war and conflict. Uh, and uh, it was a, a stunning speech, a very important speech, and one that almost has received no attention over the years. Uh, hence the uh, uh, my comment about about projection. Um, uh, I, I conclude uh, the with a an anecdote about David Ben Gurion. In 1949, uh, the first American ambassador to the state of Israel, James McDonald conveyed a 
a letter from the State Department. It's a long letter. It's complicated about territories and refugees and what have you. Uh, and uh, and the tone of it was, after all the United States has done for you uh, to help bring the state into being, then we expect you to be more forthcoming regarding issues of refugees and borders and, and, and the like. And uh, uh, Dave Ben-Gurion, uh, uh, this is based on McDonald's notes, uh, is a man of a few words, but very, uh, in this case, blunt. And he said, in so many words, their United Nations partition resolution was never enforced by the United States or the UN. Uh, Israel was not created by the partition resolution, but by a successful war of defense. Uh, and, and then he actually said to James McDonald, who he liked, who was a friend of his, he said, in 1948, if the Jews in Palestine had depended on the United States, quote, we would have been exterminated. Um, the help in terms of weapons came from Czechoslovakia, communist Czechoslovakia. Um, and uh, uh, the Ben-Gurion anecdote underscores uh, the realities, the international realities of, uh, of, of 1948. Uh, so uh, the uh, these realities were an enormous embarrassment for the Soviet Union after the anti-cosmopolitan purges. And so uh, the realities were uh, uh, not discussed or reversed. Uh, the um, uh, I have other things to say, but I just want to conclude with this uh, uh, sentence, th th this thought. What happened on October 7th should never have happened. And if the realities of 1948 and the realities of what Hamas believes had become a major theme of international politics, perhaps the Hamas dictatorship would have collapsed or would have been somehow deterred. And the many thousands of Palestinians who are dead and the many hundreds of Israeli soldiers and, and, uh, and civilians who are dead would be alive today. Uh, so what we can contribute as scholars is to cast Theodore Adorno's unflinching gaze at Islamist ideology, to describe it accurately, and to urge our fellow scholars to join us in this effort. Thank you. Up next, we have Dr. Matthias Kunzel. His paper is titled Nazi Antisemitism and the Hamas Massacre. Okay, so thank you very much, Professor Brahm and the Taylor's Institute for inviting me. And I would also like to thank all those who joined us for their interest. The surprising thing about October 7 was not the cruelty with which the Arabs from Gaza killed Jews. The surprising thing was a total failure of the Israeli security services. Even they made the fatal mistake of not taking the anti-Semitic ideology of Hamas literally and seriously. Few have spoken about this as openly as Dani Dayan, the chairman of Yad Vashem. We at Yad Vashem, he explained shortly after the massacre, are experts on Nazi ideology not on the barbaric ideology of Hamas. We have not researched it, end quote. But why was Nazi ideology dismissed as a topic of the past instead of also researching it when it touched the present as in the case of the Charter of Hamas? If the Israeli authorities had recognized in time how much the ideology of Hamas has in common with the barbaric Nazi ideology, they might have been able to prevent the massacre of October 7. Today, I want to show how strongly Nazi propaganda has contributed to escalating the Middle East conflict and to torpedoing attempts at a two-state solution again and again. Following this, I will compare the anti-Semitism of the Nazis 
with that of Hamas. Where are the similarities? Where are the differences? Let's start with the year 1937. In this year, the first plan for a two-state solution was presented by the British Peel Commission. At that time, the future of Palestine was still open. There were, for example, Egyptians who welcomed the victory of the Zionist idea as a turning point for the revival of the Orient. Others, such as the ruler of Transjordan, Emir Abdullah, sought sometimes more, sometimes less cooperation with the Zionists. A third group may have opposed Zionism, but not Judaism, while initially it was only the supporters of the Mufti of Jerusalem, Amin al-Husseini, and the Muslim Brotherhood in Egypt, who adopted the anti-Semitic approach. In 1937, the Nazis started to exclusively back this last group in order to thwart the Peel Plan. Let me quote Ferdinand Seiler, the then German Consul General in Beirut. I quote, the only way to achieve this, thwarting the Peel Plan, seemed and seems to me to lie in the efforts of the Arabs to use terrorism to intimidate the Jews and at the same time put pressure on the English, end quote. However, the Mufti's terror was not only directed against Jews, but in particular against all moderate Arabs who supported the two-state plan. At the same time, he had the pamphlet Judaism and Islam published in Cairo in August 1937. This is a shocking text that uses Islam for the sole purpose of inciting Jew hatred. During the war, the Nazis distributed large numbers of copies of this text in several languages in Muslim inhabited regions. Judaism and Islam is without doubt the forerunner of Said Qutub's infamous pamphlet, Our Struggle with the Jews. However, Judaism and Islam was already published in 1937, 11 years before the founding of Israel, with the declared aim of preventing even a small Jewish state in Palestine. Had it existed, this mini-state could have saved the lives of hundreds of thousands of Jews only four years later. But as it was, it was prevented and the Jews murdered. The Nazis' most important propaganda tool was an Arabic language radio station that broadcast from Berlin for the six years from April 1939 to April 1945 for the masses of non-literate Arabs. Jeffrey Herf, in his seminal study, Nazi propaganda for the Arab world, has shown how this six-year barrage of sound embedded Islamic anti-Semitism in the consciousness of the Arab street. These broadcasts were well done, with excellent and famous speakers, carefully selected Arab music, and a very good sound quality. Its programs, of course, were rebel-rousing rather than factual. Their aim was not to inform, but to incite the Muslims against the Brits and the Jews. According to contemporary sources, their anti-Jewish agitation was particularly effective. It was effective because the Nazis could build on the patterns of early Islamic anti-Judaism, and they could instrumentalize the local conflict with the Zionists. It was also effective because on this front, the BBC and other allied stations had nothing to say. They feared that if they drew attention on the topic of anti-Semitism, they would end up confirming the Nazi propaganda to the effect that the allies were the instrument of the Jews. It is true that we cannot precisely measure the Nazi radio's impact on, German, on, on Arab thinking. But we can compare. We can compare the Arab world with Muslim populated areas that were beyond the reach of the Nazi broadcasts. A case in point is Bosnia-Herzegovina, home of some 950,000 Muslims and 40,000 Jews. Here was no radio propaganda, in this region, anti-Semitism failed to gain a foothold 
the Middle Eastern conflict attracted little attention and there were no attacks by Muslims and Jews in the post-war period. We can also compare the intra-Arab debate of 1937 with that of 1947. In contrast to 1937, 10 years later, the statements of Arab leaders were characterized by the same rabid anti-Semitism that the Nazi radio had previously spread. So this propaganda had had an effect. That brings me to my third and final point, the 1948 Arab war against the newly founded Israel. The Nazi radio in Arabic language had to keep operation in April 1945, but its frequencies of hatred remained virulent. Thus, the idea of thwarting a Jewish state at any cost lived on and found a new home in Egypt where, after 1945, the Muslim Brotherhood built the world's largest anti-Semitic movement. By 1948, its membership has risen to over one million. The Brotherhood not only defended the close alliance between Amin al husseini and Adolf Hitler, but also hailed the Mufti as a man who would realize Hitler's dream. This hero they rejoiced after the Mufti's return to Cairo in 1946, fought Zionism with the help of Hitler and Germany. Germany and Hitler are gone, but Amin al-Husseini will continue the struggle, end quote. And the Mufti did continue this Nazi struggle indeed. He embodied the link between the Nazis' big war against the Jews that ended in 1945, and the subsequent smaller war of Arab armies against Israel that started in 1948. Today, hardly anyone knows how controversial this war was among Arab leaders. However, this is an important point. In 1947, the Arab League unanimously opposed the two-state solution for Palestine advocated by the United Nations in November 1947. However, how to react to the United Nations decision was heavily disputed until the last minute. On several occasions, the Arab League ruled out the possibility of an attack by regular Arab forces on the Jewish state. Egypt, for example, questioned this war which started on May 15, 1948, only a few days before it began. This is what General Mohammed Haider, Egypt's defense minister, declared at the beginning of May 1948, quote, we shall never even contemplate entering an official war. We are not mad, end quote. I quote in my book numerous voices of other Arab leaders who expressed similar views. They had many good reasons for rejecting a regular war. Firstly, the Arab war was a massive violation of the United Nations Charter. Second, it was an affront to the USA and the Soviet Union, as well as to all progressive forces that had previously fought the Nazis. Thirdly, there was only a small minority of Palestinian Arabs who really wanted this war. And fourthly, with the exception of the Arab Legion of France, Jordan, the Arab forces were in a pitiful state. Why did this official war against Israel nevertheless take place? My book provides evidence that it was primary pressure from the Arab street and the anti-Semitic campaigns of the Muslim Brotherhood that led the Arab rulers to overcome all their doubts and to attack Israel. In 1948, the Muslim Brotherhood was extremely influential. Its campaigns could draw on the lingering echoes of the anti-Semitic Nazi propaganda in which preventing the emergence of a Jewish state had been a constant theme. Radio Cezen, had its listeners relentlessly assailed with horror stories according to which the Jews were planning not only to destroy the Al-Aqsa Mosque, but also starting from the base in Palestine to embark 
on the total destruction of Islam and the Arabs. The Muslim Brotherhood propaganda was thus able to create an atmosphere in which war seemed to be the only logical and natural cause of action. They formed a nationalist mass movement that longed for the cathars of a military confrontation and whipped up a tidal wave of public anger that no one could withstand. The 1948 official Arab war against Israel took place because the Nazis' anti-Semitic Arabic language propaganda had shaped the post-war political climate. In this feverish atmosphere, no Arab leader felt able to successfully resist the Brotherhood's warmongering. There are therefore good grounds for interpreting the Arab war against Israel as an aftershock of the previous Nazi war against the Jews. Ideology, ideologically, the two wars were connected. But the story doesn't end here. My book shows that in retrospect, those six years of daily Nazi radio propaganda marked a turning point that divided Middle Eastern history into a before and an after. This year fostered an exclusively anti-Jewish reading of the Quran, as in the Hamas Charter of 1988. They popularized the European world conspiracy myths, as in the Hamas Charter. They shaped a genocidal rhetoric towards Zionism, as in the Hamas Charter. It is thus no coincidence that Hamas speaks the language of the Nazis when it comes to Jews. And it is no coincidence that when Hamas encountered unprotected Jews on October 7, it tortured and murdered them as only the Nazis had done before. Nevertheless, there are not only similarities between the antisemitism of Hamas and that of the Nazis, but also important differences. The common ground is that the perpetrators in both cases dehumanized the Jews in the run-up to the massacres. Another common characteristic is a paranoid fantasy. Just as the Nazis persuaded themselves and others that the Jews wanted to wipe out Germany, the Islamists claim, I quote, that the Jews have been the bitterest enemies of Islam and are still trying to destroy it as already the 1937 pamphlet Judaism and Islam stated. 16 million Jews to destroy 1,900 million Muslims. In both cases, the own intention to annihilate was or is projected onto the Jews in order to legitimize it. This projection gives rise to another commonality which Holocaust researcher Saul Friedländer has described as redemptive anti-Semitism, just as the Nazis saw the destruction of Judaism as a decisive means of bringing eternal German peace to the world. Hamas anti-Semitism is also based on a destructive utopia, according to which the destruction of the Jews is a prerequisite for the liberation of humanity under the auspices of Islam. While the internal logic of the anti-Semitism phantasm shows important similarities between the Nazis' hatred of Jews and that of Hamas, the differences clearly dominate in the execution of the murderous, murderous acts. While the Nazis tried to hide the crimes of the Shoah, the Hamas Islamists equipped themselves with body cams and helmet cameras to broadcast their bestial murders via social media. They wanted the whole world to watch their atrocities in order to intimidate the infidels and at the same time infect the believers with a jubilation and certainty of victory. Religious certainty breaks through here. The Allahu Akbar, which accompanied the crimes committed as if in a bloodlust, testifies to the conviction that by murdering Jews, they were fulfilling a mission ordered by God. The origins of this jihadist anti-Semitism, however, 
lies in the Nazi era. It is necessary for Yad Vashem and other research institutions to address this issue. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Matthias. Hamas speaks the language of the Nazis. We'll have a chance for Q&A, by the way. I hope uh, everyone understands that's one of the reasons that our presenters are being brief. Up next is our final presenter, and then it's time for Q&A. Benny Morris will address related uh, issues. Okay, hi. Um, I'll be talking about the 1948 as jihad. Midway in the um, first, I'd like to thank Gabi and Mark and uh, Telos for inviting me to this um, uh, webinar. Um, midway in the first uh, Israeli Arab War in August 1948, Emil Ruri, a member of the Arab Higher Committee, the cabinet of the Palestinian Arab National Movement blamed the Arab states for creating the Palestinian refugee problem. He argued that the Arab states had pushed and cajoled the Arabs of Palestine into launching hostilities against the Jewish community in Palestine in defiance of the United Nations resolution, while the Palestinians were disorganized and unprepared for war, and they themselves, the Arab states, launched their invasion of Israel in May 1948 while disunited and insufficiently prepared. The war had resulted in the creation of the refugee, the Palestinian refugee problem. He rejected a solution of the problem by way of repatriation, arguing that the Jews would then hold them, the Palestinians, hostage and torture them severely. Ruri assumed that a refugee return would be achieved through negotiations with Israel, and an agreement so achieved would mark the beginning of Arab acquiescence in Israel's existence. We must inculcate in the heart of every Arab, he said, hatred for the Jews, and we must renew the jihad against Israel. The refugees, he concluded, would return to their places only after Palestine was reconquered in such a jihad. Historians of 1948 of the war have tended to view the first Arab-Israeli war as a milestone and turning point in a national struggle between two peoples or ethnic groups, the Jewish Zionist and Palestinian Arab collectives, over a piece of territory called the land of Israel or Palestine. A cull through the available documentation, essentially through Israeli and Western records, which are available, points to an additional and perhaps uh, important aspect. Uh, and for some Arab participants in the war, a, do a dominant aspect, namely, namely the religious face of the war. In, in light of the available records, it would appear that many of the Arab participants, and we're talking about leaders, and uh, insofar as you can uh, sense their voice, uh, the commonality, uh, the participants in the 48th war saw that onslaught against the Shuv, uh, Israel, as a holy war, a jihad against a foreign and infidel invader. The history of the um, um, uh, the Islamic world is studied uh, by holy wars against infidel peoples and politics. The rise of Islam was characterized by an enormous aggressive jihadi wave in the seventh and early eighth centuries, which saw the Arab conquerors sweep over the Middle East and North Africa as far as Spain and Southern France. A second eruption of jihad, defensive in nature, occurred in the Middle Ages when Muslim warriors contained and then drove back the Crusaders and destroyed their kingdoms in the Levant. A third aggressive wave of jihad occurred in the early modern period when Turkic armies from the middle of the 15th century until the end of the 17th, 17th century assaulted the Balkans and Central Europe, reaching the gates of Budapest and Vienna. Today, we are in the throes of the fourth wave of jihad, and there is a dispute in the West about whether to attribute it to Islam as a whole or just to radical Islamists, a wave directed against the West and its promontories around the world, stretching from the Philippines and Mumbai through East and West Africa to London, Madrid, and the Twin Towers in New York. At the center of this wave um, uh, 
are the wars against infidels in Afghanistan, Iraq, and Palestine. One can view the current jihadi wave as aggressive or defensive. There are strong arguments for both positions. Be that as it may, it is possible that in the several in several hundred years' time, the war between the Arabs and the Jews in 1948 will be seen as the beginning of, or at least as a major milestone in, this wave that confronts the West in our time. Jihad holds a prominent uh, a place in uh, Islamic philosophy. Uh, Ibn Khaldun, the great Sunni philosopher and historian of the 14th century, put it this way. In the Muslim community, jihad is a religious obligation because of the universality of the Muslim mission and the duty to Islamize all mankind, or through persuasion or through force. Other religious groups did not have a universal mission, and holy war was not a religious duty for them, save in self-defense. But Islam, on the contrary, is bound to rule over other peoples. This is how uh, one major uh, Islamic philosopher um, uh, placed a uh, jihad at, at the center of um, the Islamic faith and the um, Islamic policy, if you like. Um, um, according to Ibn, Ibn uh, Taymiyyah, who was a, another uh, important um, a Muslim philosopher from the 13th and 14th centuries, a theologian, the obligation to participate in jihad appears innumerable, innumerable time, uh, times in the Quran and the Sunnah. Therefore, that is the most important uh, religious activity a man can undertake. All the sages agree that it is more important than the Hajj. The Prophet said that the supreme issue is Islam and its peak is the jihad. Jihad is obligatory both if we begin begin it and if uh, undertaken uh, in defense. In other words, both aggressive and a uh, defensive uh, jihad, uh, um, according to uh, Ibn Taymiyyah. Indeed, one 12th century ex exegesists, Al-Razali, wrote that one should undertake jihad at least once a year, which sounds a bit tiring, but that's what he wrote. Um, on the 2nd of December, now to return to 48, on the 2nd of December, 1947, three days after the UN vote, uh, the ulama, the scholars of theology uh, of the University of Al-Hazar in Cairo, uh, the oldest, of course, Islamic university, the most important, certainly the most religious, uh, religiously important. Um, and this ulama, this uh, council of theologians, are perhaps the most important arbiters and authorities in the Sumi, uh, Sunni Muslim world, declared a, wi while a worldwide jihad in defense of Arab Palestine. So we're talking about the 2nd of December, 47, uh, four or five days after the United Nations partition vote. In the course of the war, the ulama of al-Azhar periodically renewed the fatwa and called to jihad. The liberation of Palestine is a religious duty for all Muslims, without exception, great and small. The Islamic and Arab governments should, without delay, take the, the take effective and radical measures, military or otherwise, pronounced the ulama at the end of April 1948. On, on the day of the Egyptian army invasion of Palestine, 15 May in, in 1948, Muhammad Mamun Shinawi, director of El Hazar, in the, the chairman, if you like, of the Council of Theologians, declared the hour of jihad is struck, a hundred of you will defeat a thousand of the infidels. This is the hour on which Allah promised paradise. <laughs> the idea of 48 as jihad um, uh, um, also had um, an anti-Semitic uh, uh, spin and factor. Um, I'm not sure it was the, the, the center of jihadist thinking, at the center of jihadist thinking, but was in, important um, as a sidebar, if you like, in jihadist thinking. Um, Samir Rifai, um, who was the prime minister of Transjordan, or what became the Kingdom of Jordan, told visitors in Amman in 1947, a few months before the 48th war broke out, that the Jews are a people to be feared. Give them another 25 years and they will be all over the Middle East. And this echoes something which um, uh, Mr. Dr. Kunzel said. They will be all over the Middle East in our country and Syria and Lebanon, in Iraq and Egypt. 
They were responsible for start starting the two world wars. Yes, I have read and studied, and I know they were behind Hitler at the beginning of the movement. And this, of course, is echoed um, uh, again, as we know, in uh, the Hamas uh, charter or covenant of 1988, these thoughts about the Jews' um, responsibility for the uh, two world wars and, of course, uh, in supporting Hitler. Side by side with this traditional anti-Semitic anti message, uh, which is um, contained often in a jihadist thinking around 1948, um, there's also an historic pedigree which we must remember. Um, before and during 1948, the Zionists were often compared by Arab spokesmen to the Crusaders, and almost always it was said that their end would be similar. As the Secretary General of the Arab League, Abdul Rahman Azam Pasha, put it in 1947, you the Jews are a temporary phenomenon. Centuries ago, the Crusaders established themselves in our midst against our will, and in 200 years, we ejected them. Already in 1936-39, uh, during the um, Arab revolt against uh, the British Mandate government and against uh, the Zionist enterprise, um, uh, we have jihadist pronouncements in Palestine um, by preachers um, uh, basically calling upon the population to rebel uh, as part of a jihad. It's therefore no surprise that um, 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 in 1948, uh, when the war against uh, the uh, Zionist um, movement uh, enterprise and then the State of Israel uh, was launched, um, uh, we have uh, echoes of this again, uh, jihad as underlying this assault on the Yeshuv. Um, uh, King Farouk uh, um, of Egypt, um, though he didn't use the word jihad, said it was a matter of Jewish religion against their own religion. That's how he said the Arab street, his population, his people saw the war. Um, even uh, King Abdallah of Jordan, who was uh, perhaps the most clear headed and uh, pragmatic of the Arab leaders, uh, adopted the language of holy war when on 14 May he addressed his troops about to cross the Jordan uh, River into Palestine. He, this is what he said, uh, he told his troops as they were crossing the, 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 the river. He who will be killed will be a martyr. He who lives will be glad of fighting for Palestine. I remind you of the jihad and of the martyrdom of your great grandfathers. The religious element in the conflict has periodically um, dotted the struggle between um, the Palestine national movement um, and um, um, the Zionist enterprise, uh, certainly since the 1920s. There's a few echoes of it even before 19, the 1920s, but it was only it only gets um, um, you know in, into gear in the 1920s. In 1929, it's worth recalling that the Hajjamin al Husseini, then the Mufti of Jerusalem, soon to become the leader of the Palestine national movement. Um, um, essentially mobilized in 1929, the Muslim masses, the Palestinian masses, um, uh, to attack the Jews um, uh, uh, based on the argument that the Jews were about to take over the Temple Mount and destroy the two mosques, the two holy uh, Muslim sites on the Temple Mount. Um, and, and this mobilization of uh, Palestinian masses which many Palestinian leaders understood couldn't be achieved uh, on the basis of political ideology or political uh, preaching, um, could be achieved if you uh, touch them, touch their religious feelings and passions. Um, and uh, so again, when Hamas launched its um, uh, assault on southern uh, Israel on October 7th, the attack, people often forget it, the, the attack which they launched they named the Al-Aqsa flood. In other words, the Al-Aqsa, of course, is the uh, holier, the holier of the two mosques on the Temple Mount. The Al-Aqsa flood, meaning uh, again we are attacking the Jews uh, in defense of our um, religion, in defense of our um, most religious site uh, on the Temple Mount, which they again argued was under threat uh, from uh, the State of Israel and its Jews. 
my role as moderator, I think, is really, it comes down to one thing for me. I get to ask the first question, and then I step aside um, here at this point, and we have some questions coming in uh, submitted via the chat. I encourage others to uh, submit questions, but I'm going to steal the first uh, opportunity. I hear something rather dumbfounding. I think one of you referred to it that way, or maybe it was just me in my notes. The fact that a Nazi-style anti-Semitism is a causal factor in this conflict, which is at the center of world attention, and yet this causal factor seems not to be well understood. In the days of, and now I'm thinking of the American university, microaggressions and on and on. Forgive me if this is, uh, question is a bit provocative, but we've seen that the reception of, of uh, 710 or 107, as the Americans say, has been rather problematic. Can you explain how it is that such a glaring reality of macroaggression can't be comprehended let's say in, in in the american university context uh where where so called woke uh, we used to call it political correctness seems to hold sway uh, given that this is a, if i'm hearing you right a profoundly racist endeavor what's stopping people from recognizing that i'll take a stab uh the um the ability of Saeed Qutb or Hajim and Al Husseini to appeal to a global audience was nil uh, uh, in the 1950s and 1960s. Here, the uh, the history of the um, the Soviet Union, the Soviet bloc, the Western New Left uh, moves to the center stage, and uh, the success of Soviet propaganda, and then that was echoed in different ways by the Western Left was that all of this that we've discussed for the last hour is completely mistaken. Um, it's all Zionist propaganda. It's just completely false. And that what actually happened uh, was that uh, the, the something called the Palestinians, which is an undifferentiated term that entered uh, global politics, that the Palestinians were part of a <laughs> A re, of a revolt of what was then called the third world, now it's called the global south, against Western and American imperialism. And so uh, remarkably, the Palestinian struggle was then assimilated into that of the Vietnamese communists or the Cuban communists or what have you. And what began, according to the three of us, uh, with religious fundamentalism or the impact of Nazi propaganda, uh, that is what began as a movement of the far right uh, in global, in, in terms of the language of global politics, metamorphosed uh, somehow into a movement of the global left. Uh, and uh, that uh, that forty that went on for forty years during the Cold War, and then after the Cold War. So the. Um, and the other aspect of that is that Israel no longer was uh, seen as part of the struggle against Nazism or against fascism, but it was part of the problem. And, and so I think one, one reason that uh, the kind of arguments that we're making today, I mean, there are shades of differences and we can talk about them, uh, uh, is that for much of the liberal left-leaning academia in the United States and Canada and Europe and elsewhere, this is all ridiculous. What we're saying is completely absurd. Um, uh, and uh, uh, the so we have lost a battle over the meaning of political language hmm. uh, about what is left and what is right. Uh, uh, I think that's one reason why uh, well, why we've seen the reactions that we've seen and why this this scholarship is not more widely read and discussed that I, that's that's my that's my view let, let, me, let me give you a, a thought of mine um and it's all usually forgotten or certainly in israel it's uh, 
um, shunted aside or not paid attention to. 20 years, almost 20 years of the Netanyahu government mm -hmm. has thoroughly undermined Israel's image in the West. Forget about even the students who know nothing in campuses. I'm talking about people who actually do know something about the Middle East and the conflict. Netanyahu is seen as a subversive of Israel's democracy, certainly in the last couple of years since the new government. But even before that, um, he has completely rejected any thought of compromise with the Palestinians. I'm not saying whether this is good or bad. Perhaps compromise with the Palestinians is really unattainable. Maybe a, a, the establishment of a Palestinian state will be a mortal threat to Israel's existence, but he's seen as re a rejectionist in terms of a peacemaking with the Palestinians and subversive of Israel's democratic uh, values. And uh, this is eaten away. The image of Israel is that Israel is identified with, with, with uh, Netanyahu and the image of Israel has thus been badly torpedoed by this identification in Western mind. And to that you have to add, and this is again, something Israelis like to avoid. Um, um, uh, um, Jeff talked about context. He's right. There is this context of uh, um, anti-Semitic ideology in Islam, and not just among Islamists, but in Islam. But there's also the context of an Israeli occupation, whatever the reasons for its uh, start, whatever the reasons for its continuation, it's an occupation of one people by another, which is untenable in 21st century uh, world politics. It's not something which is acceptable. So this coalescence of Netanyahu's image, Netanyahu's values, and an occupation which seems to go on endlessly without Israel trying to end it. Um, this has led to the reaction to October 7th when they say, well, what can you expect? May I add a little comment? Uh, I, uh, that the image of Israel worsened by Netanyahu's policies. But does this explain the falsification of the Middle East history within the universities? Look, there is a very ob obvious question. Is there any relationship between the Nazi war against the Jews, which stopped in 1945, and the following war of Arab countries against Israel? Is there a connection, yes or not? This is an obvious, obvious question, but it's never asked. And my, my question is, why not? And my answer is, because people like to blame Israel also for anti-Semitism in the Arab world. So they don't want to have another factor which could uh, reduce the responsibility of Israel for anti-Semitism, which means the responsibility of Jews for anti-Semitism, which is always a nonsense, I would say. So um, it's it's a lost cause in a way. I agree, Jeffrey. Uh, we we are not on an offensive, but there are some new aspects of history writing which has to be strengthened. And so this is my little optimistic point of view that you can convince people about the history by and by, not from today to tomorrow, but over the long, longer time. Uh, one thing about Netanyahu um, that, that has always puzzled me, uh, and, I, and I know the details of his trial and, uh, uh, and uh, the sort of Shakespearean dimensions of uh, Israeli politics, but if one makes the argument that Israel is in a state of permanent emergency with Iran, with Hezbollah, with Hamas, um, then the argument that Roosevelt and Churchill made in 1940 and 41 should apply. That if the situation is that serious, then the government Israel needs should be a coalition government of center right and center left. I just want one more point that uh, that Matthias made at the beginning about the, the colossal Israel's failure of October 7th, that um, uh, 
that the notion that the government of Israel or Israelis or uh, um, the Mossad or IDF is like infallible and super brilliant and never makes mistakes. In fact, they're human beings like everybody else. Uh, and what, as a historian, one of the things that I find um, particularly, uh, well, it's nothing new, is that people learn so little from history. Uh, and uh, the uh, the alarm bells were there. Uh, the Hamas charter was 1988. Uh, it, and yet uh, people didn't draw the appropriate, in, in retrospect, uh, appropriate conclusions. Benny, why do you think that happened? Why do you think the Israeli think, government was I taking? Think, I think in I think in large measure Netanyahu is responsible, not in the way people usually suggest, uh, you know, by feeding uh, dollars from Qatar to the Hamas to appease them and so on. I think it's a, a largely a matter of the deflection of attention caused by Netanyahu's effort to undermine Israeli democracy, the judicial system, and so on. This pushed people to look at internal Israeli politics and the effort to undermine democracy and the counter effort to stop this instead of looking outwards at what the Hamas were preparing. Mm -hmm. In other words, even though the intelligence, some intelligence, uh, lower ranking intelligence uh, officers and the uh, people on the ground saw that things were happening in the Hamas and that they were preparing something, most Israelis' attention was focused on the internal battle against Netanyahu's effort to undermine democracy. And for the Netanyahu, his attention was exactly on that, not on um, uh, threats from outside. As you say, he wasn't reading the Hamas charter and he didn't um, think the Hamas were either capable or actually willing to strike such a blow. And the intelligence chief listened to him. Not, he didn't listen to them because they didn't tell him anything. And 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 uh, on the other hand, they listened to him, uh, who kept saying the Hamas is no danger. We're feeding we're feeding the monster, and that'll keep him quiet. There is no real well, explanation for it. It's it's uh, it was such a, we, a a gross a gross gross incompetence on the part of the Shin Bet. A military and, and military intelligence that there is no proper um, um, explanation to it. But the, the business of misdirection, that is the attention of the public and the generals and the politicians looking the other way because of some other problem, which was the problem of the threat to Israeli democracy, um, led to this in some way. That's really uh, troubling. Uh... To think about Benny, I I can imagine that people's attention was focused on the Kaplan Street demonstrations. I yes. personally don't know who to blame. I'm not a big uh, blame game guy at the moment. Biyachad um, Ninatzeach is my view, but uh, I think we could look at it two different ways. Pilots weren't showing up, and we had so many people in the streets week after week. I guess we took our eye off of the ball but it's um hard to know who who's responsible um the president of the united states harry truman had a famous saying uh the buck stops up here yeah and uh, netanyahu is in that office so well can team? you imagine if the u.s president had to deal with an air force that was possibly not showing up to fly the no, no, planes this, this is no you're misrepresenting what happened the air force didn't not show up the pilots showed up they just said, if this continues, we are not going to do a voluntary service. That's what they said. Not the, the Fair ones enough. who happened. It wasn't, wasn't not showing up. They said, if this continues, we will not show up. And we're talking about the volunteers, not the actual uh, um, permanent staff uh, of pilots and ground crews, etc. But then, Point, uh, Point you taken. Can blame whoever you like. But I was talking about deflection, not even who, who is to blame for it, except what uh, Jeff is saying, the buck stops here. He's the man who's responsible because he's prime minister, not just for a year, for the last 15, 17 years, whatever. Okay. Okay. Uh, point taken. Russell Berman asks, we're moving now to the Q&A portion because we have some great questions stacked up here. Thanks for the presentations. He starts by saying, if the Arab armies had won in 1948, what sort of political day after would they have instituted? 
I, he says, am not asking about how they would have treated the Jews, but rather who would have ruled the territory, a democratic Palestinian state, an incorporation to greater Syria, division among the Arab states. What if, and I know historians love counterfactuals, if, if the Arab uh, armies had uh, won in 1948, what would have happened uh, in that event? Do you think? Can you speculate? I, mm. I, I, my, my, please. Any thoughts? I mean, uh, I mean, well, that's I'd like to ask Benny. Uh, you know, the the yeah. I think um, uh, there was a historian whose name I won't mention, uh, who uh, in the New York Times the other day said that uh, of the nineteen forty eight war, no, nobody fought very well. But. Uh, <laughs> Benny, you have the exact figures. I think something like 6,000 Israelis died in the 1948 war uh, in a much, much smaller population. It was cataclysmic. Uh, it was, uh, you know, a, a, a huge national trauma. Um, uh, so I, one way of rephrasing Russell's question uh, would be, um, uh, how much danger were the Jews in in 1948 after the Arab invasion? Yeah, well, they're different. They're different questions, but um, um, e each of the Arab participants—that is, the Syrians, the Jordanians, and the Egyptians—primarily were interested in, I think, annexing chunks of Palestine. Um, the Egyptians invaded in the south; they wanted the Negev. The Jordanians invaded what we call the West Bank or the Judea and Samaria and East Jerusalem, and they took it. And the Syrians tried to get hold of the Sea of Galilee and the the land and around it. Uh, had they won the war, each of them would have probably taken more of it. None of them were interested in a Palestinian Arab state emerging. This is clear, and none would have emerged, because unlike the, the issue of the Jews in Palestine, the Palestinians hadn't prepared the infrastructure of a state in the 30 years of the mandate. The, Israel, the Jews had done this, and come 48, they simply put the, the state on the table. It was all ready. Um, so, so I don't think a Palestinian state would have emerged, and the Arab states would have simply carved up a Palestine and shared it between them. I think Benny is right. Um, after 1967, there was no interest in, before 1967, there was no interest in any Palestinian entity. So the Arab states doesn't want to have a Palestinian state at that time. And so I, I, I agree with Benny. We move along. We've got questions here in the Q&A from Louis Esparza, a friend of mine. I thanked friends of mine out there tonight. I know there are many people I haven't yet become friends with, but please email me if you've got comments and thoughts about our project. I want to thank you too uh, as well. You're all a part of this project for, for being here tonight. It's very important and much appreciated. Professor Herf, Louis Esparza asks, you discuss the affection that the French and U.S. left had for the Zionist cause in the late 1940s. When and how did that change? Mm -hmm. And moreover, he adds, relatedly, kind of, what have you found to be helpful in softening anti-Semitic beliefs in the classroom? Mm -hmm. That's a double barrel question from Lewis. There are some books, but there are more to be written about the most important alliance that Israel had from 1948 to 1967, after the Soviet Union turned against Israel and the United States uh, remained at a certain reserve and distance, and that was France. You know, France was Israel's most important consequential ally. Uh, and uh, that was under uh, centrist and left-leaning governments and uh, so uh, uh, France had other reasons in terms of the war in Algeria and uh, uh, seeing Israel as a ally there. But the legacy of the French resistance uh, uh, persisted in, in, into the post-war years and until de Gaulle's famous term in uh, in 1967. Uh, the um, you know I would just repeat what I said earlier that uh, that the generation that came of age my generation in the 1960s uh, viewed the Six-Day War through the prism 
of the struggle between U.S. imperialism and the Third World. Uh, and the PLO uh, was on the right side of that struggle and Israel was on the wrong side. So uh, that is the American side. Uh, and I think that that uh, contributed uh, enormously. And then you have in the United States, the additional factor, uh, it's a reality in Europe too, of race. Uh, and uh, a part of the black left uh, in 1967, 68, uh, began to identify with the PLO and uh, to uh, denounce Israel as part of the global imperialist monster. Uh, uh, Angela Davis brought that somewhat up to date in the, in, in the last 15, 20 years. Uh, 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 the... Uh, in terms of dealing with anti-Semitism in in the classroom, uh, the um, uh, I think uh, discussing conspiracy theories and their destructive nature, whether they're right wing, left wing, or Islamist, uh, is is essential. And uh, the um, uh, I think uh, also uh, um. When I taught a seminar on the history of anti-Semitism, uh, I think the most difficult things for the students to read, the most upsetting, um, uh, were the Christian Gospels and the Koran. And many of them had never read either. Uh, there's a lot in the Torah that I find upsetting. Uh, these are ancient texts, uh, and we're modern people. Uh, but I think that um, uh, books like David Nirenberg's Anti-Judaism, uh, the Western tradition, by the way, the uh, Islam is also a Western tradition. D dealing with these questions is is crucial. And it's also a very important part of critical theory in the Frankfurt School and social theory uh, to uh, address the causes of religious belief and um, and to approach it with a certain perhaps empathy, but but certainly skepticism and that's that's part of the meaning of individual autonomy, isn't it? Uh, to to view religion with a certain uh, mixture, perhaps of empathy, but also skepticism, and that is something we're accustomed to doing regarding uh, Judaism and Christianity, and uh, uh, it is something that needs to happen more often uh, regarding uh, not more or less, but uh, but the same level uh, of attitudes towards Islam. I don't mean to trigger the historians, but my old uh, teacher, my former teacher, Hayden White, used to like to say, uh, I guess he wasn't the first to say it, the only thing that anyone learns from history is that no one learns anything from history. And uh, again, I don't mean to trigger the historians would mention of well, uh, Hayden. You know, I, I'm Hayden sorry, uh, who, I, I don't want to dominate yeah. things, and I, I wouldn't <laughs> know what my has to say, but, but if you're the prime minister of Israel uh, in the last 20 years, um, and the Mossad and the IDF are coming into your office and they're saying they're building these tunnels. There's no reason anybody should build those tunnels other than they're preparing to attack us. Um, uh, yes, if you're here, read it again. Here's the Hamas charter of 1988. And here's their stupid statement of 2017, which basically says the same thing in language that the Western left will find easier to digest. These people are dangerous. And they're building these tunnels. It's getting worse and worse. They have 100 miles of tunnels now. And if we don't stop, they're going to have 400 miles of tunnels. And then you're going to have to send your send our children and grandchildren into those damn tunnels. And you're going to be dealing with the mothers and the fathers, all right? And explaining to them why their kids are dead. So, Mr. Prime Minister, what you've got to do now in 2010, you've got to invade Gaza now. And... That is always the problem of any preemptive war. Because you can imagine the United Nations would explode. The uh, what? You're invading Gaza and they haven't really attacked you in a full scale invasion? Bunch of aggressors and warmongers. So the uh, uh, when we say we, people don't learn from history, it's also it's very, very difficult to start. Uh, how can I rephrase this? The decision to start a war is momentous. And hope, we now know after October 7th, was mistaken. Yeah. Let me add to that. It's not just the United Nations. It's the Israeli public. 
No uh -huh. prime minister could have gone into Gaza in a full-scale war without support of the Israeli public, and the Israeli public wouldn't have countenanced it because it wouldn't have known that October 7th is going to occur. They would have said the Hamas is weak, the Hamas is impotent, as Netanyahu kept saying, um, and they wouldn't have uh, supported a war of aggression against the Hamas, even though the Hamas was uh, gradually building up its p a potential to launch its own war of aggression. It's the same as with Hitler going into the Rhineland and, and the, the Western democracies. When, when do you preempt? When do you start a war when your public isn't with you? Is there any lesson here regarding Iran? In Iran, the danger is slightly more understandable because they are moving towards atomic weaponry and a preemptive war would be better understood uh, by the Israeli public and perhaps by Western democracies, except America had the experience of Iraq and Afghanistan losing there and don't want to get embroiled in another conflict. And if Israel struck Iran, uh, the Americans would probably be sucked in, which is what Biden doesn't want. And the American public certainly doesn't want. So there's a real problem there of preemption. But I think the danger is clearer than that was, than was the danger from um, uh, the Hamas pre-October 7th. The danger today from Iran is more intelligible, more understandable by the Israeli public. And uh, that's, my, that's my view. That's my view. Yeah, and I think that would be the lesson of October 7, that you take what the Iranians are saying literally and don't uh, say, well, it's just rhetoric or something like that. Uh, so you have to yeah. take it very seriously and have to draw consequences out of what you saw now with October 7. I think this is the main lesson of this terrible attack. It's also important to remember how terribly unpopular Winston Churchill was uh, in the mid 1930s. Um, yeah, yeah. Uh, he was by... considered a war. He was considered a warmonger. Yes, yes. Mm. From Marcus Charlesworth, we have. Another question, why was the Arab world of the 1930s so receptive to Nazi ideas, especially as Nazism's pagan inflections and elevation of the racial above the religious seem haram? Is it just a matter of a shared hatred of Jews making strange bedfellows, or was Nazism dovetailing with other trends in the Arab world? The advantage of the Germans uh, thought they had was that in contrast to Britain and France, they had not been colonial powers in the Middle East. They right. played a lot on that. Uh, and, it wasn't uh, so much Nazism, it was, was hatred of Britain and France for being colonizers, yeah. while Germany wasn't. So they supported the Germans in World War II. Yeah. Not sure it was the but, Nazi ideology especially. But mm. on the other hand, when the Nazis tried to to convince Arabs about their racist development of anti-Semitism, the, the racist idea, they were not successful. Arabs uh, denied that racism exists, and so the Germans had to switch to religion and to open the door by saying, well, that Mohammed was a great guy who pushed away the Jews from Medina and Hitler is doing the same as Germany and so on and so forth. So it was not um, from the beginning that the Arabs loved this anti-Semitism of the Nazis, but the Nazis were quite flexible in changing their argumentation and they were quite good in putting themselves in Muslim clothes to say that. There's, there's an interesting anecdote about the Berlin Olympics, which illustrates this. There were um, Arab and Turkish husbands in Germany who contacted the Arab and Turkish embassy after the passage of the Nuremberg race laws 
and they expressed fears that their marriages would be dissolved <clears throat> because the laws uh, dissolved marriages between Aryans and non-Aryans. Uh, and uh, they said, well, the policy of the German government is that of anti-Semitism, and, and we are Semites. Uh, so is the German government racist towards us? And this led to some high-level discussions in the Nazi interior ministry in the Rassen Politische Sam, and, uh, uh, and the conclusion was that the Nazi regime is not an anti-Semitic regime. That language should not be used. It's, an, its policy is that of Judengegnerschaft, or hostility to the Jews. Uh, and, uh, uh, and this was the way the propaganda, uh, this, this was the language of the propaganda. Uh, not, uh, it, it, the propaganda was not anti-Semitic, but it was anti-Jewish. Anti uh, and with that reassurance, then, the Arab countries agreed to come to the Berlin Olympics in 1936. From Bat Yeor, my question is to Matthias Kunzel, what is the role of the EU in anti-Zionist propaganda in the afterwar period, to shift focus a little here? Its alliance with jihadist uh, movements like the PLO and now Hamas, and I don't know, could we throw in UNRWA? What, what is the role of the EU and of the UN and, and of um, you know all the smart people of the world in um, assaulting us? Well, uh, the EU, EU is not one block. And when it comes to Israel and the Middle East, there are different methods to deal with the problems. Ireland is much more against Israel or France then, for example, at the moment, the German government, who tries to keep a kind of balanced position, we are half with our half heart on the side of the poor Arabs, on the other side of our heart, we are on the side of the Israelis. So these are different tactics. And, um, but um, within those countries, there is not a real fight against anti-Semitism and Islamic anti-Semitism is growing in Britain, is growing in France, is growing in Germany, for example. So this is the main challenge, I would say, the internal conflicts and the role of radical Muslims in those countries. I don't know if you're planning to have a discussion in this series on Islamophobia, but... Uh... I just read uh, or I reread Pascal Bruckner's um, uh, Imaginary Racism, Islam Islamophobia and Guilt. So, and if the listeners to our webinar have not read Bruckner's book, I, I would urge you to do so. Um, mm. uh, it, it came out of the debates in France, uh, 2010, 12, 15, uh, uh, in response to the terrorist attacks there. Uh, and it's a it's it's a brilliant essay um, uh, and uh, very relevant to our discussion here. And that um, Bruckner makes the case um, we can't in the you know in the news today hear from the U.S. anything except a denunciation of anti-Semitism and Islamophobia, you know, um, as if October seven had not been. Uh, what it was. Well, I think it's, I, it's relevant to Telos because it, it's important to think clearly psychoanalytically about the meaning of terms like phobia um, and uh, the distinction between phobia and fear and rational and irrational fears and um, the, uh, uh, yeah, enough said. To what extent do you see an uptake of aspects of fascist ideology, particularly Cardini's? proletarian nationalism into third worldist ideology, contemporary rhetoric about the global South, the Nazis, the Italian fascists, and the Japanese empire all freely adopted the language and symbolism of anti-imperialism to justify their actions. Do you think any aspects of this uh, might have bled into the contemporary anti-imperialist and so-called anti-colonialist movement what do you guys think? I mean, I'll... is there is there fascism I, in the in the you, upsurge if, of uh, if the question, protests? If the questioner reads the Hamas Charter of nineteen eighty eight, 
and uh, uh, and Matthias, I think, made that clear. The the idea that the Jews started World War II was a core theme of Nazi propaganda. Uh, uh, and uh, so in that sense, the Hamas charter is an after effect of Nazism. Uh, there, there are elements of Nazi thinking in that charter. Uh, but um, one issue that we're not dealing with today, I hope that the Tilo series will deal with, is the question of gender uh, and uh, and fascism and Nazism. Uh, uh, the, the more we learn about what happened on October 7th, the more this issue uh, uh, comes to the fore. And uh, uh, I you know, that, that is, uh, Klaus Tableit wrote a famous book in Germany called uh, Men are Fantasy and Male Fantasies uh, about the fear and hatred of women. Uh, but what we see, what we saw with Hamas uh, is, is a, of another dimension. Um, I don't presume to understand it. I'm not an expert about that kind of thing, uh, but I hope that you will find some people who are. Uh, one of the most bizarre aspects of what's happened in the United States is that various women's studies programs have taken the lead in denouncing Israel? Uh, so, uh, how that's happened, I, you know, uh, that's a good question. Thanks, Jeffrey. One step ahead of you in March. Thanks for mentioning it. A short announcement: uh, we have a panel on gender oh. and ten seven with the great Batya Unger Sargon and Mariam Memarzdegi. Uh, mm -hmm. a, a fantastic um, activist um, concerned with the Iranian regime and a third panelist yet to be announced, but I couldn't agree with you more. And that's why we've been working on that one. In April, we've got a, a panel on um, uh, reform of higher education in view of uh, 107 and its reception on campus. But the question of gender is high on our oh, good. agenda. Thank you for reminding me. Uh, we've got so many questions in the queue here. Um, thanks for this panel. I'm a PhD student, student at UC Irvine, a uh, very fine school indeed in German studies. And this panel has proven very helpful. Do you see perhaps an overcorrection in the academy to focus on post-World War II racism? As distinct from anti-Semitism, Jonas asks, as a part of the problem, could that overcorrection in focus be a part of the problem? And do you see a tendency to ignore the complicated histories of the mid-20th century in favor of sexy or easy narratives of history? Do we have to pick and choose? The questioner asks, has this somehow contributed to our failure to grapple with a potent ideology that you have described for us tonight as being a causal factor in one of the most brutal crimes against humanity in, in living uh, memory? Uh, what do you think? One of the problems with being a historian of modern German history uh, in the United States is that if you ignore the history of um, uh, anti-Semitism uh, in the Nazi regime or in the Soviet bloc, uh, uh, if you ignore that, then you are comparable to an American historian who doesn't want to talk about slavery, who doesn't want to talk about uh, Jim Crow, doesn't want to talk about white racism. And if you're an American historian who doesn't want to talk about white racism, uh, <laughs> you're in big trouble um, because people will just say you're an apologist, you're a hack, you're not serious, you're not really a historian, you're just a publicist. Um, well, the problem with being a historian of modern German history is that if you ignore why the Nazis decided to kill the Jews instead of the Protestants or instead of the Catholics or in, um, whatever, um, at least from my generation of German historians, people won't take you seriously. You're, you're, you're trying to avoid uh, the central issue. 
because it's an extremely unpleasant issue. Very unpleasant. So if you want to avoid it and you want to talk about everything else, but then we know something about you. We know that you're someone who doesn't want to face the central issue. Okay, so we know that about you. And well, for young Americans who want to do German studies, it's a problem. Because you're in a field in which the questions of hatred of the Jews or whatever is central. And you're living in a country in which what people are more comfortable with is talking about white racism. And so you are kind of the odd person out. Uh, you're the kind of skunk at the party. You're the person that's raising the issue, you know, oh, the Jews are white, the Jews are privileged. You know, what's the problem? You know, it, 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 when you go into the field of, of modern German history or German studies, um, it just comes with the territory. Uh, some people find that very uncomfortable and they want to talk about everything else, but. Thank you, sir. We, we, we have just a little bit of time left. And so I think we should end with this question from David Pan, if you will permit. Uh, David writes, there seems to have been an inability to see the signs of the coming attacks on October 7th or the, the coming attack on October 7th for what they were, signs. So the breakdown was not in data collection, but in terms of the doctrine that was used to interpret this data, which is to say that the doctrine was that Hamas was not an immediate threat and was in fact more concerned with ruling Gaza than attacking Israel. That is the government seemed to have forgotten all you've been saying and have been laying out today or tonight for us uh, Jews over here in the Jewish state. If so, how has Israel's doctrine now changed and what will be the consequence of that change? Well, it's pro probably going to drive Israel rightwards. Israel was moving rightwards anyway, demographically and politically uh, in the last decade or two. And this attack will probably drive most Israelis further to the right, um, more hardline towards uh, Arabs, more suspicion of Arab intentions. Uh, that's going to be the immediate effect, in my view. Uh, though, though the Israeli public at the same time uh, has become disenchanted with Netanyahu. So it'll move rightwards while ousting Netanyahu if there are elections anytime soon. Anyone else on this final question from uh, David Pan? It seems that there were signs of the coming attack, but somehow the interpretive mechanism uh, failed. Uh, we we yeah. couldn't imagine, as Yossi Klein Alevi said the other day, the, the sheer cruelty we, we thought we had a cold, clear eye of Hamas. I mean, who on October 6th thought Hamas here in Israel, uh, Benny, was a bunch of nice uh, guys? We, we, we were not idiots. But, but Yossi Klein Levy said the other day, I heard him uh, on a podcast saying that we, we, we didn't imagine this level of barbaric cruelty. Yeah. Well, th this goes back to the... Um... Uh, the statement I made at the very beginning about Telos. Um, we German historians, uh, Karl Bracher coined the phrase, uh, are preoccupied with the, what was called the problem of underestimation. Uh, the problem of underestimation of Hitler, uh, the problem of, um, and, and the problem of underestimation now of Hamas. And it is um, in a democratic society in which people are accustomed to negotiating and compromising and the messiness of politics and uh, cynicism and lying in politics. And uh, the idea that people could say crazy things and actually mean them is very difficult uh, to accept. And uh, Hitler could give his speech on January 30th, 39, and people would say, well, of course, he doesn't really mean that. And very smart people thought he didn't really mean that, not just you know, very, very smart people. 
so um, the Middle East uh, uh, Media Research Institute has some splendid videos of uh, shopping centers and Mercedes Benz and beachfront homes in in quote the open air prison of Gaza, uh, uh, and uh, so the hope was that this uh, 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 you know plethora of, of materialist goodies would would erode the ideological core. That gets to David Pan's question about the interpretive framework, the discipline of intellectual and cultural history, um, often offers interpretations that are very unappealing, difficult to hear. That seems like a good place for us to pause and to transition to the uh, after party, except I see Matthias has a something to say on, on his lips. What we can learn from October 7 is I think we, we have to improve our ability for imagination. Uh, we, we have to think about worst case scenarios much much more clearer than in the past. And there, there was a little a nice factor. I, I, I mentioned in my talk Dani Dayan, the chairman of Yad Vashem, who admitted that they had not researched Hamas, but they did now a, a conference together with me and my new book, which is a little bit of progress, that they are interested in those issues. And so I'm not completely pessimistic what the future will bring. Okay. Thank you. Let me say that uh, Matthias's Nazis, Islamic anti-Semitism and the Middle East is a really important book. And I hope people who listen to this webinar will read it. Thank you. Here, here. Here, here. I couldn't agree more. I see Benny nodding. Yeah. Well, when you've got three of the finest historians of our day agreeing uh, on something, um, you know, take it to, to heart. I couldn't be more privileged than to host this event. For their support of the Telos Paul Picona Institute's Israel Initiative, we wish to thank the families of Nancy and Paul Oberman and Lynn and Rabbi Samuel Stahl, who continue the commitments of Lois and Willard Cahotis in support of Holocaust education. Lois and Willard Cahotis dedicated their lives to enhancing respect for humans of all faiths and beliefs while creating space for understanding and acceptance of the differences and the similarities inherent among peoples.